Hi everyone. In our last video, we were exploring different random effect structures in our longitudinal models, uh, and we ultimately came up with three different models that we wanted to test. We had the random slopes, random intercepts model, which was our most complicated model shown here in the figure. You can see that each subject has their own unique slope and intercept. Uh, we had a random intercepts fixed slope model in which we actually allow for a slope for the effect of time, but everyone has the same slope. They do, however, have different intercepts, which is why this is a fixed slopes random intercepts model. We also had our simplest model, which was just a random intercepts model. So in this one, everyone uh, effectively has the same slope in that no one has any slope. The slope is equal to zero, right? So this is just an intercept. It is one constant value estimated for everyone, but it is still a random intercepts model. So each person gets their own unique estimate of the intercept. So we have these three models that differ in complexity. And what we ultimately want to understand is which model is the best fit for our data. Which of these models, when we're just sort of looking at the effect of time, is actually the best approximation of our data? And at the moment, we're only considering linear models. Uh, in session two, we'll actually be considering curvilinear uh, models. And in subsequent work, you might even want to compare curvilinear models with truly nonlinear models, in which we fit a, a negative exponential function, uh, for instance, or some sort of logarithmic curve uh, to the data. So following along uh, with the script file, you know, we're down on line 230 now. Uh, we've built our three models, which are, we called RANF00, RANF01, and RANF02 for our three random effects models. And we can use the ANOVA function to make a comparison between all of them. This output will give you a lot of different pieces of information, but in particular, we want to look at two different uh, columns. The first is the uh, deviance column actually over here. And you can see that as our models get more complicated, the deviance is going down. As you might recall from the lecture and previous lessons you've had on longitudinal data analysis, right, the deviance is essentially a measure of model fit. More deviance is bad, so seeing the deviance go down is a good thing. Uh, we can test the change in the deviance using things such as the walled test, which is a, a the, the change in the deviance follows a chi-square distribution. So we can look at the change in the deviance, that gives us the chi-square, and the degrees of freedom is based on the number of parameters different, the number of degrees of freedom different we have between the two models. So in the first case, we're going from three to four degrees of freedom, so that's a 900 point change in the deviance with one degree of freedom. That's highly statistically significant. Uh, as we go to from the fixed slopes to the random slopes model, uh, again, that's a reduction in the chi-squared. It's a 131-point reduction in the deviance. Uh, but there's two more degrees of freedom to doing that um, because we have now not only a random slope, but we have the correlation between the random slopes and the random intercepts. So that's two degrees of freedom uh, for this model. However, that's still a pretty big reduction in the deviance, so that's a statistically significant reduction in deviance. One of the concerns with just using the walled test for the change of deviance is if we're adding additional parameters to our model, they're going to be explaining additional er uh, error, right? They're going to be reducing the deviance uh, just by chance. And there's always a trade-off between the complexity of the model um, and the error that's actually being explained. So without getting into more detail about this, there's some additional information in the handouts and there's way better uh, exhaustive sources on exploring what an information criterion actually is. But we're going to look at the Akaike's information criterion, or the AIC. So the AIC is here in the second column, uh, and the AIC is based on the deviance, but it introduces a penalty based on the number of parameters. So if you look across the rows, you can see that the AIC is going to be reliably larger than the deviance because it always imposes a penalty for adding a parameter to your model. So the goal here is to try and reduce the AIC, but because there's a penalty for adding additional parameters, uh, that's actually going to prevent us from overfitting the model. And in general, the model that gives us the lowest AIC is what we would consider the best fitting model. Uh, and and the, the, the virtue of the AIC is actually that the model with the lowest AIC has the best predictive deviance. Um, and sort of the best conceptual way to interpret that is if it's someone else took, uh, sampled from the same population and they ran identical models to yours, 
they would most likely arrive at the same answer. They're probably going to arrive at the same best fitting model. Now, that could change if they tested other models. There might they might find other models that fit better. They might collect different data or, or, or you know, collect it with a higher resolution in some way. Right? But essentially, if someone had the same design and imposed it on the same sample, the model that you find with the lowest AIC should also be the model with the lowest AIC when tested in their data. So that's what we mean by predictive deviance and why the AIC is a really interesting and useful statistic from a model fitting perspective. Now, if you want to get into the actual details of what the AIC is and how it's calculated, that's beyond the scope of uh, what we're talking about today. Um, but it's definitely worth digging into if, if, you want to, if you want to take that on. So based on these model fit statistics, we would ultimately conclude that our random slopes model is the best explanation of the data. And the substantive interpretation of that is that not everyone has the same slope. Our fixed slope was not a really good estimate. And in fact, we explained significantly more variation when we allowed the slopes to vary. So that means that there's a lot of variability between the individuals in terms of how they change over time. So if we want to explain some of this variability then, we have to start building conditional models. So we're going to not only try to explain variation in the slopes and how people change over time, but variation in the intercepts and why some people might start off at a lower value than another person. So in order to do that, one of the first things that we're going to do is actually uh, transform uh, the value for time. Currently, it's in months, and months go from 1 to 18. But what we want to do is actually transform this into years. And the reason for doing that is that most of our other variables are not on a similar scale uh, to months. And if we start to add in interactions when we're multiplying you know, 18 by some other value, the data can get very big. So in order to reduce uh, potential collinearity and, and reduce potential issues with um, scale, uh, scales just being very off between our variables, we're going to convert this from months into years. We'll also do this in two different ways. So we're going to create one variable that we call year.0. Okay, and you'll, that, that is centering the value or creating a, a, a meaningful value for zero in the year variable. So the first data point is effectively year zero. The second value of year we'll create, we'll call year.c, which is a contrast coded value of year. So for year dot C, zero actually means the average year or midway through our data collection. So year dot zero puts the zero point at the beginning, at this initial point in all of our data. Year dot C puts the zero point at the midpoint, at the average value of time in all of our data. So we can look at the effects that these two different um, values of time have on our fixed effects and our random effects. So in the first model, we use year.0. And without going through the, the full details of the summary, let's look at the fixed effects. Our estimate of the intercept is 26.589. Our estimate for year.0 is 25.857. So the way to interpret these, the intercept is the value when year is equal to 0, which in, when we have the year.0 variable is the very beginning of our data. Okay, so this is the estimated value when someone has first started therapy. This is the Roche scaled FIM score for someone at the very beginning of data collection. The slope is a one unit change in X. How much do we expect to see Y change? So the slope is 25.857. That means for every one year we, we measure people for, we expect to see their Roche FIM scores go up by 25.857. So someone starts at, on average, 26.589, but they improve at a rate of about 25.86 points per year. Now let's contrast that um, with year dot C, where rather than zero being the beginning of data collection, zero is the middle of data collection. Again, we'll look at just the fixed effects for the moment, but you can see the fixed, effects for, the fixed effect for the intercept is 44.90. The fixed effect for year dot C is 25.857. So our fixed slope has not changed. The slope is still the same because changing what zero means on the X variable doesn't change the slope. It does change the intercept, however, because the intercept is the predicted value of Y 
when x is 0. So in this case, our intercept is now 44.904, right? because that is the middle of data collection. That is the estimated Roche scaled FIM score for someone who is in the middle of data collection. So deciding how we want to scale our x variable and what we want 0 to mean is going to have a significant impact on how we interpret our data. So moving forward, we're going to stick with the year.0 variable. There are good reasons you might want to choose the mean-centered version of the time variable, but for our purposes, we want to look at year.0 because that corresponds to when participants entered our study and we're fixing everyone on that point.